Good morning, Sail Alliance Church family. It's so good to be here with you. Whether you're in the room or on live stream, we are one family and it's so good to be together. I have some really exciting news to share with you. Last week, we had 12 people come to the cross. Isn't that amazing? We had 10 people make new commitments and two made recommitments. And I just wanna read the names of the people who made first time commitments. And if you would just tuck those away in your mind and pray for them this week, um, that would be amazing. So if you would pray for Elizabeth, Joseph, Aurora, Charity, Hadley, Amelia, Emily, Isaiah, Maria, and Sparkle. That would be awesome. The fun thing last night was one of the girls who accepted Christ, she came up to the cross and she said, is there any way that I could take my rose? <laughs> She's like, I wanna keep it. And so she got to take her rose. So there's only nine up here if you count, but it represents 10. Uh, my name is Ashley Dalen. I've been on staff here for 10 years as one of your high school pastors. And I just recently made a switch to uh, pastor of neighborhoods in the outreach department. And it is such a privilege to serve our neighborhoods through our partnerships and our events. And I just gotta tell you, God is active in bringing peace to our neighborhoods. I have a really fun story. Is it okay if I share it with you? Yes, I hear that energy, okay. Furniture Bank is an amazing ministry that got started here. There's nothing quite like it in Salem and so there's a lot of needs that we get to meet. And what it is, is it's a ministry where you can bring new or used furniture and you'll see Kent in that picture. He's our lead volunteer and he heads it up and you can donate it to us. We keep it in a warehouse and then when men or women in our city are in need and they don't know where to turn, they get to turn to us and say, would you be willing to help me? And then Kent gets to set up a time to go and just bless these people. And so he told me that back in June, he got a phone call from a single mom with a one-year-old boy. And she said, I just got a new apartment and I, and I need some furniture. Is there any way you'd be willing to help me? And Kent said, absolutely, what do you need? And she said, well, I need a couch and a dining room table. My son and I are sharing a bed and a dresser and that's fine, but I just need a couch and a dining room table. And Ken said, are you sure? Is that all? And, he, and she said, yeah, that, I, just please, that would be so gracious. He's like, okay, well, we do our deliveries on Saturday, so let's get you scheduled for this Saturday. And she just got deflated. And he said, is that gonna work? And she goes, well, I work two jobs, and there's only a few days a week during the week when I have a small gap between my jobs. So Saturday wouldn't work, and if that's how it works, then like, I totally understand. Um, thanks so much for your time. Kent said, no we can come up with a creative solution. So he gets a couple guys who's willing to do a special delivery during the week with him. They show up at, I'm gonna call her M, M's house, M's, M's apartment, and they look around and there's not a single piece of furniture in there. Her baby boy is sleeping on the floor in the bedroom and they walk in and Kent just says, where's the bed? You told me you had a bed. And she said, oh, I think it's gonna come tomorrow. Maybe someone's gonna give me one. He said, okay, do you mind if I just start bringing in some stuff. I know you said you only needed two things, but can I just start bringing in some stuff? And if you don't want any of it, no big deal, we'll take it back. But I'm just gonna start bringing some stuff in. And she said, okay. So Kent and his crew brought in a full-size couch, an armchair, a coffee table, two end tables, lamps, dining table, microwave cart, dresser, bookshelf, baby crib area rug, quilts, blankets, dish sheets, dish set, and sheets and towels. And they just start pulling it in. And M is just, just shocked, she doesn't even know what to say. She's on the phone with a friend. She's like, you wouldn't believe it. They just keep bringing stuff in, it's wild. And she's taking photos and these guys are just setting up her apartment. And they set up her whole apartment and she's in tears. She just cannot believe it. And she said, would you pray a blessing over my apartment and over me? And they're like, yes. Absolutely. And so they get to pray with M in her apartment and bless her and pray with her. And when that is done, she's just crying and says, all I asked for was a couch and a dining table set and you furnished my whole apartment. I cannot believe it. Kent wrote to me to say, needless to say, a few of us got a little choked up ourselves as we were able to witness 
firsthand how our God provides for those in need. Here, yeah, let's, yes, let's, we gotta. I want you to know, family, that here at Salem Alliance Church, we are for our neighbors, and we are co-laboring in creative ways to show our city what true peace looks like and where true peace can be found. And you guys are a part of that, and so thank you so much. We are three weeks into Family Gathers, and Family Gathers is where we worship together, grow together, and have fruit snacks together. So if you've been waiting for your morning sugar high, feel free to dive in. And this series has been called Imago Jesus. And we have been looking at how can we image Jesus? How can we trace our lives over Jesus so that when we're at the park playing with our friend Evie, they see what Jesus is like. When we're talking to our neighbor Jack, who mows his lawn at 6 a.m. every day, he can see what Jesus is like. And when we're interacting with our coworker Stan, who always takes the last of the coffee, even he can see what Jesus is like. And so we've been on this journey of what does it look like to live like and be like and sound like Jesus. And Brian kicked us off two weeks ago with telling us how we can trace our lives over Jesus and the way that we forgive. And then last week, Kari spoke on how we can trace our lives over Jesus in the way that we value kids, both giving to and receiving from them. But today, I wanna tell you about Ken Allen. Now, how many of you have a favorite animal? All of you. Everyone has a favorite animal. Turn to your neighbor, what's your favorite animal? Go, or just say it out loud, one or the other. Or at home, say it out loud. What's your favorite animal? My husband's favorite animal is an orangutan. Those cute orange, just fluffy little guys. And because of that, Every once in a while, we'll go on one of those random deep dives down YouTube and watch a lot of orangutan videos. And it is that that led us to Ken Allen. Ken Allen was an orangutan who lived in the San Diego Zoo from 1969 to 2000 and is famous for his creative escapes. Let me tell you about him. When Ken was a little guy and he had a small cage, when the zookeepers would leave at night, he would unscrew the bolts of his cage crawl out, explore the nursery, and then make sure to crawl back in and bolt himself back in before anybody noticed. As Ken Allen grew, so did his enclosure, and with that grew his creativity. (laughs) One day, a worker left a crowbar in his enclosure, and Ken Allen saw it, picked it up, and said, oh boy, do I have a creative use for you. He handed it to his friend Vicky, who was an orangutan in a nearby enclosure. She cranked open a window and Ken Allen escaped. Ken Allen, with his 250 pound body, found ways to climb the rock wall of his enclosure and escape on a regular basis. You could see Ken Allen wandering through the San Diego Zoo, looking at the exhibits just as if he was a tourist. He loved it. (laughs) Can you imagine being at like the flamingo exhibit and he walks up? <laughs> oh, it'd be so fun. Ken Allen, they, he just kept getting out. So they decided, let's put him with some friends. Maybe like if we give him some friends, he'll be distracted. He'll stop getting too creative. But not our Ken. He just taught others how to be creative. A couple months later, some guys who were washing the windows of the enclosure accidentally left their five-foot squeegee with Ken. And Ken and Jane and his new friend Kumong, they used that five-foot squeegee and I'm sure as you can guess, escaped. (laughs) Ken Allen gained the nickname Harry Houdini because he was filled with never-ending creativity. And today I wanna talk about creativity. And here's a couple things that I think we can learn from Ken Allen about creativity. The first one is this. Creativity does not mean being good at the arts. Ken Allen did not dance or sing or draw, but Ken Allen was creative. Creativity is simply the act of turning new and imaginative ideas into reality. That could be a new way of using a spreadsheet or pouring concrete or teaching someone the ABCs. The second thing we learned from Ken Allen is that creativity is not always having the biggest and craziest idea in the room. 
But creativity is the ability to see things in new ways and generate solutions. It's simply the ability to say, what if? Or imagine if, when a situation comes your way, before just defaulting to the obvious, uninspired, or rote solution. Ken spent a lot of time saying, what if I can climb these walls? The third thing we learn is that creativity is not creating new ideas or solutions out of thin air. Creativity is using the resources available in potentially new and unexpected ways. Believe it or not, the squeegee was not invented to be an orangutan escape device, but Ken reinvented that resource. And resources are not just things or people, but can be knowledge and experiences as well. In Genesis 2, we see the triune God in ultimate creativity mode. He's designing walruses and puffer fish and little creatures that smile like this. <laughs> and Genesis 2, verses 19 through 20, tells us this. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. One of the first activities that we humans did with God was be creative. God creatively designing these complex and beautiful creatures and us creatively naming. I imagine laughter as Jesus shows this little guy to Adam and says, what are you gonna name him? And Adam goes, you are not making this easy on me. <laughs> and as I read this as an adult, I can go, well, this feels kind of silly. And yet I feel God whisper back to me, no, this is sacred. God's invitation to image his creativity is a powerful partnership that glorifies his name. Colossians 1 tells us that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, that Jesus put on flesh and walked around to show us what God is like. And so let's look at him. If you have your Bibles, pull them out. Let's go to John chapter 6. That's where we're going to be today, um, verses 1 through 15. And as you're pulling that out, I would just love to pray for us as we dig into the scriptures. Holy Spirit, as we come to the scriptures today, would you illuminate your truth to us? We invite you to convict, encourage, and shape us to be more like King Jesus. We deeply desire to image you, Lord. Amen. We are actually going to watch the events of John 6, 1 through 13 on the screen, but if you want to follow along on your, in your Bibles, the narration follows the NLT very closely. And don't forget as you watch to say, hey oh, back to Jesus. <laughs> Turn your attentions to the screen. Stories of the Bible. Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is Jesus. Hey oh who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He did many miracles and healed people of their sickness. Oh, hey, everyone. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. The crowd started to gather around Jesus. There were 5,000 men and many more women and children. Turning to Philip, he asked, Hey, Philip! Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? You see, Jesus was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Um... Philip replied, Even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Yeah, I got an idea. Then Andrew spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Jesus said, tell everyone to sit down. Bye. 
that, Mary Mom. Let down. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and gave them to the people. There you go. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Want some more? I'm all good, thanks. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers, so that nothing is wasted. You guy. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps, left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves and two fish. The story opens quickly with a situation. We've got Jesus, we have the disciples, we have men, women, and children who need food. And we have this situation right off the bat, Jesus acknowledges and engages the situation. Now that's pretty incredible in itself because if you're anything like me, I know sometimes I'm not quick to engage in every situation. Like maybe for example, you walk into the kitchen and you see that your brother spilled milk all over the floor and you just look at it and go, not my problem. Or maybe you look out your, your front you know, window and you see maybe an unhoused neighbor walk by and they have an empty water bottle and you just think, eh, not my problem. Or maybe you're at Fred Meyer on Broadway Street and you see a piece of clothing fall off the hanger onto the floor and you just kind of go, eh, not my problem. I know, me neither. <laughs> but Jesus acknowledges and engages in the situation right away and it's hungry people. Jesus then turns to Philip and asks, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? Jesus invites his disciple to be creative with him. That's so cool, Jesus is inviting Philip in. He's saying, let's do this together. He's turning to Philip probably because where they're at was nine miles from Philip's hometown, Bethsaida, and so he's probably saying, Philip, this is your area, this is your neighborhood. Like, what are some creative options? What could this look like? And the scriptures say that Jesus was testing Philip. Now that's not a word we like. We hear that and go, ooh, no Jesus. But that is something that a rabbi would do with his disciple. He would throw out a question or a situation in attempts to test his disciples' understanding. And that's what he's doing with Philip here. He's not hoping that Philip fails the test, but he's hoping that as Philip leans in, that Philip will grow in his faith in this moment. Jesus invites his disciple to be creative with him. It is at this point that we gain access to our crowbar and squeegee resource. If you have a kid near you, give them a high five. That's right, why? Because it is a boy who has the eyes to see the possibilities that are beyond reason, right? It is a boy who comes and says, here is my five barley loaves and my two, my two fish. I don't know if any of you have cats, but to me this is the equivalent of like when your cat comes in the morning and lays a dead mouse at your feet and looks up with you with that smirk and says, look mom, I brought you breakfast. You're like, oh thank you. <laughs> The likelihood that that mouse is gonna be your breakfast is the same likelihood that five barley loaves and two fish are going to feed thousands and thousands of people. And not only that, but barley loaves were what the poor of the poor would eat. Barley was cheaper than wheat. And so this is like the poor, poor, poor bread that's being brought here. And then these fish, this is not some sort of nice Alaskan cot yumminess. This is probably just pickled sardines that this boy is bringing. These are pretty unimpressive, simple, and humble resources. It'd be as if I came to you and said, here's five peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and here's two shrimp flavored top ramen packets. Go at it. And yet, Jesus does a miracle. He uses these unimpressive resources and he feeds thousands and thousands of people. And not only that, John is clear to tell us that there are 12 baskets of leftovers. Why does he tell us that? 
He tells us that because in Roman custom, if you were to host a party or to feed people, it was expected that as the host, you would provide more than enough, that there would always be more food left over and that that was proof that you hosted well. And what John wants us to see here is that not only does Jesus provide for the people and meet a need, but that he provides above and beyond, that he is the best provider and host. Jesus provides a creative solution using unimpressive resources. Now the animated story that you just watched ends in verse 13, but there's two more verses in this story that I think are critical and crucial to understanding the whole picture that we need to walk away with from this event. And so if you have your Bibles open, look at verses 14 and 15. Again, we're in John 6, verses 14 and 15. Because the rest of the event says this. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Jesus multiplying and providing for the crowds with bread would have taken that audience to two places. One would have been 2 Kings 4, where Elisha does such a thing. He multiplies bread, 20 loaves of bread, but feeds 100 people. And they would have also gone to Moses, the incredible leader of the Israelites. And as he led the people in the wilderness, manna would come down and feed and provide for all the people. And we're clear with the clear little detail that this event is happening right before Passover, which means that Jewish hopes are high right now. They need a deliverer. They want a deliverer to come and take away the oppression that they're experiencing. And so as Jesus does this creative miracle in this creative way, they're going, this is the guy, this is our new Moses, our new leader, our new king. And Jesus knows that this is not quite his time, and this is not quite how it's gonna look, and so he slips away. But the reason I think we need this book into this is because Jesus brings a creative solution that points everyone to the king. And that's important. They walk away knowing that he is King Jesus. And they know more about what kind of king and kingdom he is because of this moment. And we see this over and over again with Jesus. He brings creativity to his teachings, to his travel, to his relationships, to how he handles confrontation. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from this, it's this. When we image the creativity of Jesus, we bring solutions that point everyone to the true king. When we image the creativity of Jesus, we bring solutions that point everyone to the true king. And that is what's happening in ministries like Furniture Bank. Solutions to problems that are creative that point others to who the true king is. But here's my problem and maybe you'll relate. I read this this analogy in a book and I just loved it. Imagine that Jesus and I are on a football team together. I know, hard to imagine, but we are. And imagine that it's the beginning of the game and the ball has been kicked off and Jesus grabs it and he is running it back. We are going all the way. This is amazing. Jesus is dodging people. He's spinning. He's jumping over people. And I'm not quite as fast as Jesus, obviously. So I'm a little bit behind him. But I'm behind him going, this is awesome. Keep going. You're doing it. This is great. We're going to take this all the way back, Jesus. And Jesus looks at me out of the corner of his eye. He says, Ash, are you watching what I'm doing? And I'm like, yes, you're killing it. And he's like, okay. And he throws me a lateral pass. And I grab it, and he's looking at me like, go! And I set it on the ground, and I go, and I go, everybody, did you just see what he did? Wasn't that amazing? Like, let's just take a moment and just, let's praise him. That was awesome. Good job, Jesus. He deserves our praise, but 
What I'm supposed to do in that moment is I am supposed to run the ball back. Jesus is saying, I've showed you how to do it. I've showed you what to do. You've seen me spin and move and jump. Don't just stand there and celebrate me. Don't just stand there and talk about what I did. Don't just stand there and debate about what I did. Go and do likewise. And that is what he's calling us to. And that's lateral pass is what we're seeing with these church, church plant startup. Jesus is pitching them the ball and they're grabbing it and they're running with it. And Jesus is like, yes, celebrate me and run the ball. Imagine if we walked into friends' situations, work meetings, classrooms, coffee shops, or sat around dining room tables where we believed that God was inviting us to image his creative solutions, to have his eyes to see possibilities. What miracles would we see that would just blow our minds? and bring absolute glory to King Jesus. Our prayer can simply be this, and I think this is a place to start. Jesus, the situation I want to acknowledge is blank. Maybe there's a situation that you've continued to go, eh, not my problem, not my problem. Maybe he's tapping your heart to say, eh, maybe I want you to pick up that ball. And then to ask Jesus, what resources have you placed around me or in me? Jesus, show me. Show me what you've placed and given me stewardship over. And then how might this creative solution show others who you are and what you are like? Because we want to image you, God. No person on that grassy hill at the edge of the Sea of Galilee could have imagined the creative solution that Jesus had up his sleeve. And yet that creativity dwells within us. And so I will say it one more time. When we image the creativity of Jesus, we bring solutions that point everyone to the true king. So let us not be a people who just clap and hooray. We need to do that. Our God is worthy of praise. But let's not just be people who clap and hooray as God creates the animals. But let us be people who say, yes, I want to be in this with you, God. I want to partner with you. I want to image you. I want to name those animals. Let's do this together. And let's be all in and run the ball back as he's done it. Are you with me? Yeah. I'm going to close us in prayer. King Jesus, thank you so much for your example of how no wall or sea or situation is too great for you. You have a creative solution for every situation. And so we come before you and say, Jesus, show us. Give us your eyes. Help us to see the things that you see. We want to see your miracles here on earth now. Help us engage in the situations around us to believe that your creativity dwells within us, to see the resources you've placed in and around us, and all for the sake of your glory. Because, Lord, we want to see a city at peace with you. And so we're going to watch you, and we are going to do our best. We love you, God. Amen.